Thank you so much, not just for the kind words, but for the English translation, which allowed me to follow along as well. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to move into our, um, into our program here a little bit farther. As you may note, we are a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to keep moving right along nice and quick. Our next respected guest is the Reverend Danny Fisher. Danny Fisher is the chair of the Buddhist Chaplaincy at the University of the West, a professor and coordinator there uh, in Rosemead, California. And prior to his appointment at U West, he served on the adjunct faculty for Antioch Education Abroad's Buddhist Studies in India program. He also taught for Hartford Seminary and Naropa University. He earned his bachelor's degree in religion from Denison University, his master of divinity from Naropa University, and a doctorate in Buddhist studies at U West. He was ordained as a lay Buddhist minister by the Buddhist Sangha Council of Southern California in 2008. Please help me in joining for a warm welcome, the Reverend Danny Fisher. Assalamu alaikum. If you don't mind, I'd like to start uh, my remarks today with a little exercise. So hopefully this will change things up a little bit for a moment. Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, I'd like to ask you to uh, close your eyes for a moment to uh, imagine a few things with me. So for the beginning of the exercise, I'd like you to imagine the people in the world that you care most about. Your parents, your friends, your husband, your wife, anyone who you feel great degree of warmth and love for. And I'd like for you to wish all the happiness in the world for them. And when you feel ready to move on, I'd like to ask you to imagine someone you find difficult or people you find difficult. Uh, people who it's a little harder to generate uh, much feeling of love for. I'd like you to imagine them. And then I'd like you to wish for them all of the happiness in the world. When you're ready to move on, I'd like you to imagine people maybe that you don't normally think about. Um, people who don't necessarily generate much, if any, feeling uh, for you. This could be people maybe that you notice but don't think about. Um, anyone who kind of sort of pops to mind as I say that. And I'd like you to wish for them all the happiness in the world. And when you're ready to move on, I'd like you to imagine all of the people in the world, not just your family and friends, not just your enemies, not just people who you feel kind of neutral about, but everyone in the world. And I'd like for you to wish for them all the happiness in the world. Thank you. So in theory, this is supposed to be the heartwood of any Buddhist's practice. And I think the thing you might have noticed about that practice is a kind of generation of unconditional love for all people. Uh, not just the people close to you, but the people who you might consider to be difficult or even enemies, uh, people you don't necessarily have any feeling towards, and people you may never meet, people all over the world. But obviously, I'm here today to speak to sort of why this is not happening in parts of the Buddhist world. And something I found helpful not long ago was a piece that appeared in the New York Times by uh, Keenan Malik. Uh, and it's about how the violence perpetrated by Buddhists against Muslims in Burma should sort of burst a lot of idealistic notions about Buddhism. I think a lot of people imagine, uh, particularly in the Western world, that um, Buddhists are all nonviolent. Buddhists are all peace-loving. Buddhists are not people who do the things that we see 
in the news reports that were shown here this, this afternoon. Um, his piece entitled uh, Myanmar's Buddhist Bigots is not a very easy reading for Buddhists, but I think it's a very necessary one. And I think his thesis is quite right. Now, this is not to say that Buddhist scholars and practitioners and scholar practitioners have not been working to sort of help Buddhists and others sort of take off our rosy glasses about the Buddhist world. Indeed, I think they have. Thomas Tweed, for example, has written about how the media has represented the religious rituals and public engagements of Buddhists and Muslims very differently, and in doing so has sort of failed to do justice to the reality of either community. John Whalen Bridge and Patana Kitasara uh, recently wrote a book called Buddhism, Modernity, and the State in Asia, Forms of Engagement, in which they revealed a tendency among many to promote a sort of Buddhist exceptionalism in which Buddhist actors and institutions are seen as somehow transcending politics and transcending a kind of humanness. In addition, Buddhist leaders and luminaries have penned at least three open letters on the situation in Burma. The International Network of Engaged Buddhists has helped to facilitate the formation of the International Forum on Buddhist-Muslim Relations, a commission of inquiry. And Jodo Shinshu priest John Iwohara spoke last year at this event, reminding the assembled that, quote, the pain and loss of losing a loved one is the same for everyone. And I think another Times uh, piece that uh, appeared this week is worth noting as well. Uh, Min Zin in his piece, uh, The People Versus the Monks, uh, he writes, intellectuals have sometimes criticized monks, but typically it was for falling short on their own rules, not for political reasons. We were taught to think of any corrupt monks as deviant, keeping intact our faith in the virtue of the robe and the wisdom of the Buddha. But now a gap is growing between a significant segment of the monkhood and a significant segment of society over the issue of religious radicalism. The unprecedented chasm between the monkhood and the people is for now a source of tension and turmoil, but it augurs well for the country's political and social development in the long term. The advent of a counter movement to Buddhist extremism suggests that the people of Myanmar are emancipating from traditional elites and taking a major stride toward modernity and democracy. All of that said, there needs to be more, much more. For a long time now, the United Nations has considered the Rohingya to be one of the most persecuted minorities in the world, and things have not, getting, not been getting better. Just three days ago, Reuters offered a major report about the situation, writing, the campaign to isolate Muslims living under apartheid-like conditions is gathering steam in Western Myanmar, driven by Buddhist activists emboldened by the country's transition from military rule. Religious violence since 2012 has killed hundreds of Rohingya Muslims and displaced more than 140,000 in Rakhine State. Survivors live as virtual prisoners in camps or in segregated villages, subject to restrictions on travel, and in some areas, marriage and the number of babies they can have. In recent months, Buddhist Rakhine activists and politicians have spearheaded a campaign to restrict health care and other aid for many of the estimated one million Rohingya living in the state, aid workers say. As if we should not already be troubled by this as Buddhists, one part of this sentence should grab the attention of us as Buddhists. Quote, driven by Buddhist activists. The deplorable acts, many of which we saw in the uh, video, are too numerable to mention, but I wanted to highlight a few more in particular that have been, I think, particularly alarming for me. In March, Doctors Without Borders was banned from doing their work in Rakhine State. This follows earlier reports that radical Buddhist groups, led by not just nominally Buddhist lay people, but by monks, were preventing their medical professionals from delivering assistance to sick, injured, and otherwise in need Rohingya. In addition, one of their operations managers had noted that many of the organiz organization staff were now afraid to work in the area. He said, I've never experienced this degree of intolerance. What we really need is for people to understand that giving medical, medical aid is not a political act. 
Buddhist monks also blocked the opening of a Rakhine office for the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, the OIC, a global body that wanted to open an office in the country in order to assist the Rohingyas and contribute to reconciliation efforts, which again, as the video pointed out, are very desperately necessary. The Democratic Voice of Burma has reported in the past that the all Arcanese Monk Solidarity Conference has called for the Burmese to identify Rohingya sympathizers so that they may be targeted and exposed as national traitors. Reflecting on the monks' behavior even before these incidents, foreign policy's William McGowan referred to, quote, Burma's Buddhist chauvinism, and the Bangkok Post stated more bluntly, this is racism, not Buddhism. This is insanity. Whatever complications exist in this situation, there is absolutely no universe in which these sorts of things should not be categorically deplored in the strongest terms by Buddhists worldwide. When I spoke uh, to people at the conference last year, I was not a speaker here, but I uh, attended and wrote an article about uh, the 2013 conference. Uh, one of the conference spokesmen said to me, Burmese Buddhists uh, are different from other forms of Buddhism. They don't actually look at Buddhists as ones who can inspire, they don't look to other Buddhists as ones who can inspire them. Unless you can find a Bur Burmese Buddhist in Burma's Theravada tradition to say, killing people is wrong and you should not do it, I'm not sure how things will go. Another conference spokesperson was more optimistic about the wider Buddhist community saying, it would definitely be helpful, definitely, if there was a more pronounced response from the Buddhist world. The teachings of the faith are being flouted by these thugs and they should now speak up. There are Buddhist monks in Burma speaking up, but they are in the majority. And Dr. Udin, who will be speaking today, agreed and said, American Buddhist organizations can do a lot to influence the anti-Muslim monks in Burma. We really believe that American Buddhist leaders can have a tremendous influence on this situation and teach the heretical Buddhists in Burma that this is not the right path. We would like to open up more dialogue with the American Buddhist community, in fact. And when I was invited to speak today, I think one of the things the organizers hoped I would do was um, maybe help make some more connections uh, not only for people in this room, but um, for Buddhists who are hopefully watching the live stream or will later investigate what was said here today. Um, there are a few things I sort of found in looking around. Um, one of the things that was specifically asked of me was that I speak to the issue of Buddhism and nonviolence. Um, obviously, we're seeing a tremendous amount of terrible violence coming from the Buddhist community. Um, how is this at odds with what the religion normally states as being kind of acceptable uh, practice, acceptable behavior? Um, I found an interesting uh, book entitled Inner Peace, World Peace, Essays on Buddhism and Nonviolence, which was helpful um, in that my, uh, my colleague Don Swear had written a piece about Theravada Buddhism and nonviolence specifically. And in it, he looked to many examples from the Buddhist tradition um, that uh, underscore the uh, importance of nonviolence in not only Buddhist practice, but tradition and culture as well. Um, and his examples spanned from um, the ancient world from the time of the Buddha and King Ashoka to the modern world to people like Ajahn Buddhadasa. Um, and he found, uh, I think, that Ajahn Buddhadasa often put things uh, very well. And one of the things Don writes is, Buddhadasa believes that an earlier age was more aware than ours of the way in which everything exists together in unity. Buddhadasa says, our ancestors knew this. They taught that we should do what we can to promote the coexistence of all beings and that we should be kind to one another according to the law of nature. All beings are able to exist to the, to the degree that they form a society, a mutually beneficial cooperative. This is the handiwork of nature. If nature lacked this character, we would all die. Those who know this principle hold fast to it. And I think, you know, our vice president made an interesting point when he spoke um, earlier today, uh, quoting Martin Luther King. And it reminded me of uh, perhaps one of the most famous teachings of the Buddha when he's talking about how one should deal with um, anger, in particular perceived slights, perceived uh, threats from others. And this is what the Buddha had to say about that. 
but himself. He abused me, he struck me, he overpowered me, he robbed me. Those who harbor such thoughts do not still their hatred. He abused me, he struck me, he overpowered me, he robbed me. Those who do not harbor such thoughts still their hatred. Hatred is never appeased by hatred in this world. By non-hatred alone is hatred appeased. This is the eternal law. I think remembering our own Buddhist heritage might help the monks and others in Burma uh, lead in a different way as agents of reconciliation in a part of their country that has been plagued by hate and violence for a terribly long time. May all those in Myanmar be, may all those in Myanmar be well, and may all those in Myanmar be peaceful. Thank you. <laughs>